So good afternoon, uh, welcome. I'm Marty Downs and I direct the LTER network office. I wanna thank you for joining us today and thank you to our organizers and moderators, Paige Kleindel and Gabe De, Ro De La Rosa. Paige is a PhD candidate at the Florida Coastal Everglades LTER and Gabe is the communications officer in the LTER network office. Uh, they both put in a ton of work to bring you such a wide array of perspectives for today's event. Uh, today's Federal Career Forum is hosted by the Long-Term Ecological Research Network and the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. And I'm just going to say a couple of words about LTER and CESU uh, before we dive into a little advice from uh, author and career consultant Lily Whiteman and the discussion amongst all the panelists. So the LTER network advances ecological understanding of long-term dynamics of populations, communities, and ecosystems through the integrated use of observation, experiments, and modeling. The LTR network now includes 27 sites and nearly 2,000 researchers, staff, and students. The LTR network office coordinates synthetic research and community engagement and represents the LTER network to the scientific community and the public. Many LTR researchers and students are motivated by a desire to apply the best ecological science to the challenges of land and water management and conservation. The Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit Net Units Network is an extraordinary partner in that work. The CESU or Co Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit and uh, Tom Fish, who directs the CESU, really makes his apologies. He's traveling internationally and it would have been the middle of the night for him to make this introduction. Um, the CESU is a national consortium formed 25 years ago to support research, technical assistance, education, and capacity building for research stewardship of public trusts, including lands, waters, and cultural resources. Over 500 partners, including federal agencies, tribes, universities, state and local governments, and NGOs, collaborate within 17 biogeographic regions across the US and its territories. CESU partners work in interdisciplinary teams to address natural and cultural heritage resources in an ecosystem context. Awesome, well, thank you all again, uh, panelists for doing all of these incredible uh, pre forum interviews. And so what we're going to do now is transition into our Q&A. There's been lots of questions um, in the Q&A section. Please keep adding questions as you think of them. Um, I'm just going to go down the list real quick, uh, introduce the names of all the panelists again, if you didn't, weren't able to see all the videos beforehand. And then we're just going to jump right into um, the question. The questions, Gabe and I are going to alternate in between asking questions. And so panelists, feel free to raise, lift up your hand emoji uh, if you want to answer a question. And so our panelists we have today is Paul Julian from the Everglades Foundation, Holly Sweat from the Smithsonian Institute, Ke Kevin Cuniff from the Miccosukee Tribe, Donato Surratt from the National Park Service, uh, Lisa Baron from the Army Corps of Engineers, Allison Roy from uh, USGS, Allie Ainsworth from National Park Service, Laura Brandt from US Fish and Wildlife, Sarah Spaulding from USGS, uh, Stephanie Shiruga from BOEM, Andrea Nocentini from the Seminole Tribe, Chuck Rhodes from US Fish and Wildlife, um, Gina Ralph from the US Army Corps of Engineers, David Walters from USGS, and then Chris Oishi from the USDA. And so starting off with our first question I see here in the chat is what federal resources have you learned about uh, for creating and maintaining budgets, particularly while working um, for the EPA or the USGS? And I think we have a couple um, panelists here today who are working for the uh, USGS, uh, maybe David Walters or Sarah Spaulding. 
Um, and I think also Chris Oishi talked a little bit about the difficulties behind maintaining budgets. So Paige, uh, just to <clears throat> clarify the question, they wanna know what resources are available for us to maintain budgets, to do budgets? Yeah. Um, I don't think that there are specific resources. Um, you know, the USGS uses online budget tools. So we have a, a centralized budgeting process called Basis Plus that allows us to basically track all the spending on an account. <clears throat> and at the beginning of each year, we can load um, load our budget into that software. So we could say, you know, this is how much salary we're paying individual scientists or technicians, and this is how much money we're putting into supplies and equipment and travel. Um, there, as a Fed, um, there are trainings uh, in how to use basis. Uh, not everybody uses this. So I'm a, I'm also a supervisor in addition to being a research scientist. So I have to be familiar with that stuff, but I, you know, for my early career scientists, I basically keep them away from all of that. <laughs> it's tedious. And the software is, uh, well, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, Chris, I wasn't sure if you were going to ha have uh, anything to add as well. No, I, I think, you know, as, as starting off, you get very little training, um, but that's the, the other part of the bureaucratic system is that you have very little responsibility to do anything with money. So um, you'll learn there's training over time. Another series of careers within the federal government are um, the, the support staff that um, do budgets that, you know, that actually track the money. And um, there's a tremendous, I think, you know, through there's tremendous people that work there um, in, in a lot of the different agencies and, and are, can be super helpful too. So um, it's something I wouldn't worry about it too much, um, but uh, something to maybe get ready for when you get a big grant. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be an exciting burden to, to deal with. Cool, thanks so much. Um, all right, jumping on here. I really like this question. Um, what do you think are some of the misconceptions about a federal scientific career? I know a lot of you touched on sort of your initial ideas coming in or thinking about a federal job when you were a graduate student, but I'm curious now that you've been at a federal agency for a long time, what are some of those misconceptions? Um, and we'll probably take up to three answers from you guys. Stephanie? So I guess one of the biggest ones is that our jobs can get boring and monotonous. Um, that is definitely not the case with mine. It's always changing um, just because I'm involved with a lot of different things. I have a lot of opportunities to get involved in different kinds of projects, working with other agencies, academic researchers. And so there's always stuff going on. And then to make it even more interesting, uh, we always have the administration changes whenever we have our elections. And so that uh, always throws something for a loop. Uh, so never boring. <laughs> Chuck? Yeah, I think another uh, misperception is that it's all very bureaucratic. And, uh, and of course, there is, there is certainly a, um, a good vein of bureaucratic uh, stuff working through all of our, our agencies. I work for the US Forest Service, and there are some people that I work with that that's pretty much all they do. But I work outside in the field um, most of the time. I, I write papers the rest of the time. And so the amount of bureaucratic um, kind of nonsense is I'd say it's maybe 10, 15 percent for me. And, and, and you know, it's sometimes of the year it's more, but it's uh, it's surprisingly not that bad. So that to me is one of the big pluses. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I would say that maybe some people think that you don't have a lot of flexibility in federal questions. And somebody asked a question about how you even come up with research projects. Um, I know a lot of federal scientists, not just those the positions like mine in the co-op unit, 
um, really get to design their own research a lot and have a lot of flexibility to pursue the types of research that they want to do within the scope of the position for sure, but um, a lot of flexibility um, to do, you know, really interesting research and that can change a lot as your career changes. Great, thanks. So something I heard in a lot of your interviews is that sometimes over time or even just right now, uh, your jobs are mostly in the office based. And so we had a question focused on, are there any uh, federal agency jobs where there might be like 80% office work and 20% field work? Um, I know some of you are able to get out into the field to show different sites for different projects, but are there any ways to uh, incorporate more time outside into your everyday job? Stephanie? So I think it really depends on the agency you work for and then your specific role. Um, so for example, at our agency, um, we don't typically do a lot of research ourselves just because we're so small, but we fund a lot of research. So we design the studies and then, you know, we basically manage the technical aspects of the contracts. And so a lot of times we have um, potential opportunities to actually go out on a ship with whoever's doing the work for us or, um, you know, th little things like that. And um, so that's one way that you can actually, if, even if you have a typically more desk job, to actually be able to get out and do things a little bit more often. Um, the other thing that uh, we do have in the federal government, which is uh, something I got to actually do recently, is um, we have fellowship programs. Um, so we have something, for example, that's called the Embassy Science Fellowship, where um, it's a partnership between the U.S. State Department and embassies around the world and other countries. And so we get to basically have federal scientists can apply to work on projects. So I actually got to spend three weeks in Colombia on the ground helping them with you know some of their water quality issues and things like that. So there's like kind of side opportunities to um, from a professional development standpoint that we have available. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Laura? Yeah, so so what Stephanie said about it, it really varies from agency to agency and what positions you have um, within that agency. So for example, the picture in my background here is when I was the senior wildlife biologist at the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge as part of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I got to spend a lot of time out in the field as I was managing the biological programs there. And, and so there's a lot of opportunities on national wildlife refuges to get positions that are more field-based. In addition, in some of the other programs within the Fish and Wildlife Service, there can be different levels of field in, engagement. We have a partners program where their job is to go out and meet with landowners and um, help incorporate what the landowners are doing into the protection of our species. So they spend a lot of time going out both being in the field, but also interacting with the landowners. So it really takes a little research into the, the agency and the positions available to see what the flexibility for um, field positions versus in the office. That's great to hear. Uh, Chris? Yeah, a little bit. I think if, if Looking for opportunities with an agency that has a duty station and also some land uh, where your research site is at. If, if you can be at a research site, um, it provides opportunities to, you know, get out, you know, on a daily basis if you want to or run out, to, you know, just leave the office for a little bit and, and you know, muck around in the woods if you if you like. Um, I, I, something I mentioned to one of the answers in the chat, too, I think as for career development opportunities, I think you go you probably will end up spending more time on in front of the computer writing, you know, Doing more writing and analysis, so um, which also may kind of correspond with um, you know your your willingness to be out in the field as weather conditions get worse and you get older also. So yes, very true about getting older. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm curious about this next question um, about whether or not you all did a postdoc and what the value of a postdoc is to either your role or roles in your agency. Is there anybody here that hasn't done a postdoc? Perfect. So we'll take a couple from uh, answers from folks that have done a postdoc and a couple that, from, uh, that have not. Uh, so let's start with David. 
Yeah, I started my <clears throat> my career with the Environmental Protection Agency as a postdoc, and um, it was very valuable because I, it introduced me to working for the government because I, I think the government is this mysterious black box to people who don't work there yet. And so doing a postdoc allowed me to, to sort of test the waters of what it's like to be a, a federal scientist, get to know the culture of an agency. And, and, and also, I think a big difference in the federal government is the scale at which they can do research and the teams, the large teams they could pull together are beyond what can be done on like a typical NSF grant. And so the I think the, the big value was learning how to work on these teams to address larger, more complex issues um, and really test the waters to see if I would like to be a government employee. Because for, you know, while I was a postdoc, like most postdocs, I was applying for academic positions. Um, but then when a federal position did come up and I was quick to apply for it because I enjoyed it. I'll stop there. Great, thanks. Stephanie? So I am kind of halfway between did a postdoc and didn't. So I did a very short postdoc, which was basically rounding out a few loose ends on the project that I did for my PhD and mostly a time killer while I was trying to find a permanent job. <laughs> um, and so I did have value in it in that it, you know, it gave me a little bit more experience, um, you know, extending what I had done during my PhD. And, you know, I got to have a little bit more responsibility as far as like overseeing lab technicians from, you know, kind of that, I guess, people management perspective. But it did not really, it wasn't really something that I think helped me long term in my career or was really needed at all <laughs> to get to where I am today. So great. Thanks. Paul? Yeah, I guess I'm going to have to be in the camp with Stephanie. I did, uh, I do like everything backwards. Um, I actually got my PhD um, while I was working um, and continued to work and eventually did a postdoc as a part-time kind of thing um, to help out a, a lab with some data analysis since I'm a data guy. And, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, postdocs, you don't, necessarily need one to get a job after a PhD. Um, you know, it depends on kind of what your your plan is. Uh, if you plan to go into academia, maybe that's a, a good route. Uh, but if you're going out into the non-academic world, like, you know, agency or, or nonprofits, you know, postdocs aren't necessarily necessary. Um, it's just an, another stepping stone in, in your kind of research journey, career journey that that you can kind of tack on there. So... I'll leave it at that. Allison, did you have your hand raised from earlier? Yes, um, I did not do a postdoc, but I was just going to say that I really enjoy hiring postdocs <laughs> for the National Park Service. Um, I did mine uh, while working for the Park Service, my PhD, so it was pretty slow and not really recommended to do it that way. Um, but I came up through management, so I kind of am dancing the other way along the line between research and management. But I think um, it is helpful for people, like from our perspective, it's great to have a postdoc with some of our research needs in different park units and to have them still tied to a university, because that really helps us keep that strong connection. Um, and then, you know, Obviously, you're meeting all these people and building relationships, so it does, can increase your potential for getting a job there. So. Thanks, Donata. I have to say I'm appreciating hearing all of these perspectives. I thought I was the weird one. I actually got my postdoc while I was still doing my PhD. I was brought down to... Um, Arthur R. Marshall Locks, Haji National Wildlife Refuge. And I still had three months to go before I was gonna graduate with my PhD. <clears throat> so I actually defended while I was doing the postdoc down here. I did the two years of my postdoc and that's what actually set me up to uh, apply for the position that I got with the National Park Service. So I can't say that it's critical or it's the most important thing, but you know, each one of you are gonna take a different route. And, I just don't turn down opportunities is, is what I would say ultimately. 
Over. Thanks. All right. And Kevin, last one. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I suspect I may be the only panelist here who doesn't have a PhD and then therefore did not have access to a postdoc. But that all being said, um, what I'd offer here is for everybody who's listening and thinking about where their career trajectory is going to be, focus first on what you're interested in and see what I have, uh, regardless of if that takes you in an ac academia route where perhaps uh, a postdoc may be um, more better suited for you to kind of understand better um, how to work within academia, um, presumably with the university at some point. But it's been my experience being out in uh, both the private sector and with state and now tribal agencies that postdocs aren't necessarily um, giving you a heads up over others. Postdoc is a great opportunity for experience and experience you can be getting in other capacities, certainly in a professional working capacity as well. And so I guess that is really an individual decision, um, but it, it doesn't necessarily require a postdoc for you to perhaps uh, achieve a federal position or a, a tribal position or a position in another non-academic uh, capacity. Great, thanks. A lot of unique perspectives there. It was really nice. Um, I think we should move on to the next question. Paige? Yeah, sure. So thinking about that transition into postdoc, into working for um, an agency, I have a question here about what are some of the largest challenges that you faced when moving um, from grad school and academia into uh, the workforce working for an agency? Yes, yeah, Stephanie. Figured I'd volunteer. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest challenges, I guess I would say I had was getting over the stigma that with a PhD, I just wanted to be a researcher. <laughs> um, it's a lot of times when you do the PhD route, people are thinking traditional academic, or you only want to do research, you only want to work in a lab or in the field. And for me, that was never what I wanted to do. I wanted to always do a mix. And so it was very different coming into the federal things and, you know, applying for things at a higher level because, it, yeah, I kind of wanted that that mix. And no. Thank you. Gina? Yes, so I think one of the biggest challenges is communication style. Uh, I think in the workforce, you're not just speaking with scientists and other academic leaning individuals. You're talking with the general public, you're talking with your colleagues, you're talking with uh, various interested parties in the public. And so in order to get your message across in a way that is understandable to all, you really have to be conscious of the language that you're using. Um, so it was trying to take the science and communicate it in a fashion that was relevant to project managers, to engineers, and to those interested parties in the general public. Thank you. Lily? Hi, I just say a couple of things. One is, you know, when you go from a university to an agency, it's such a different world. Um, and it's so important to learn about the organization. Um, even if some organizations have, you know, formal orientations and some don't. And if you don't have one to um, read as much about it as you can before you get there, like press releases, strategic plans, all of this stuff is probably on their website. and to find people as best you can through the grapevine who, who will take the time to sit down with you and talk about the organizational culture and just look at an organizational chart. It's a basic thing, but it, it can be a, a real lifeline. Um, and also if you're a researcher and you want your research um, to find the public and, and be heard, um, 
get with the communications office of your agency and tell them about your research and make a relationship so that when you do have a good finding that um, it will have legs, build those relationships before you need them. Um, and and to, to remember that the research that is known is more likely to, um, to have collaborators get funded, um, to come out to, you're not just talking to the people in your lab, you're talking to a wider audience, hopefully. Thank you, Allison. Yeah, I was just gonna echo what Lily said in terms of culture. There's a huge cultural difference between academia and federal positions. And I remember in my federal postdoc feeling um, it, it just a huge shift with people just coming in regular hours um, and having to work regular hours and not feeling inspired to work beyond that or harder because of who you were surrounded by. And it, it took me a while to find the people and the culture that I wanted within the federal government, but it was there. So um, so, so I think, you know, part of it is, is navigating that. And the other navigation piece that I wanted to bring up was about roadblocks. There are undoubtedly, everybody on the screen knows that there are challenges working in the federal government. And I think the hardest part that I still have is trying to figure out which ones are true, like, you know, it's, it's best to just follow this rule and do this, and which have other options. You just have to understand how to navigate the system. And, you know, being patient with yourself and talking to a lot of people to be able to figure out which ones, you know, really do have other options so that you can do what you want to do. Um, it's challenging, but um, it's really rewarding when you can figure out within your position to pretty much do all the things that you want to do. Thank you, Chuck. So an, another kind of time thing, I, when you get out of academia um, and you start to work for federal agencies, a lot of times research projects can go on for much longer. We, we do a lot of long-term research in the Forest Service. Um, we do projects that are usually beyond the scope of a typical graduate project. And so thinking kind of uncoupling from the academic semester and three-year master's or post or PhD project is important. And, and it's just a difference. And, and you know, often there are graduate projects that are kind of nested within these longer term um, studies and, and so on. And so that's, that's one of the differences. And the other one is that when, at least in my agency with the Forest Service, we sort of have a built in um, scientific audience. Uh, the land managers on federal uh, lands are very interested in our findings and help us direct it, in fact. And so we have kind of a different focus. And I think that was brought up earlier. We, we talked to a lot of audiences that are not just the scientific publication community. We talked to land managers that may have a very specific question um, that we do some research on um, or, or um, watershed stakeholder groups and so on. So it's a kind of a variety of voices that we listen to and that we speak to. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And then we'll take David and then we can move on to the next question. Yeah, so three things. Uh, one sounds silly, uh, acronyms. Like I joined the EPA and that I said that they spoke acronyms. I felt so lost because of all of the shortcuts. We actually got a cheat sheet that was like 10 pages long of acronyms. So it took a while just to be like, how do I, I don't understand what people are saying. That is tied a little bit to the comment that Lily made about the structure of the organization, you know, the EPA is a big sprawling uh, bureaucracy, and it took a while to figure out like what the different parts of EPA were and how they connected and how the research arm of EPA served those other parts of the agency. So that was difficult. And, and I think I'll echo something Allison said about just learning how to navigate the process. Um, it is easy to feel a little beaten down by the bureaucracy when you when you start because you don't you don't know how to do things and so my first supervisor her words of wisdom uh, but my first day was like you have to embrace the process you got to lean on your team we have people who can help you navigate things don't let yourself get beat down if you need help go get help and unlike graduate school where we sort of felt like you know we had to do everything ourselves it's very independent um within federal science, 
you you have to learn to lean on uh, the rest of the apparatus, if you will. Great, thanks so much. And that sort of leads me into another interesting question about that apparatus, um, which is in your positions, who sets the research or project agenda? Is that the individual person or the agency or how does, you know, how much autonomy do you have over those research questions or project questions? Stephanie? So again, this probably varies a lot by agency, but for our agency, it's a bit of everyone. <laughs> so we kind of have the top down priorities and in some aspects that comes from the government administration at the time. So for instance, renewable energy is really big right now for us. Um, so you've kind of got that side of it. And then you've got sort of the in between management level that, you know, takes the administrative priorities and says, okay, like, here's what we need to take with those. And then from the bottom up, we also, as you know, scientists and, and resource managers, we identify information gaps and needs that we have to be able to do our jobs more effectively. And so we actually have a study process where we propose study ideas and then the management staff kind of finds a happy middle ground. <laughs> so it's a little of both for us. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, within in the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, I'm in the water mission area, and we have a little bit of both. Um, there are some high-level directives that come about um, researching certain topics, but then within that, I have a lot of ability to shape the questions and the directions of the resource, the research. For example, I'm looking at a 22-year record of chlorophyll concentrations across the country. Um, and that came out of uh, developing how I wanted to pursue that question. Um, also within the USGS, I had a, actually it's a grant program within the USGS. So other USGS researchers can propose projects that address water quality in national parks and it is completely up to the uh, USGS and Park Service partners to design those programs. So I just say it covers the whole range from being dictated to having flexibility. Interesting, thanks, Chris. With the Forest Service uh, in the research and development side, of it, my answer is probably similar to, to Sarah's. I think there's quite a bit of flexibility. It can depend, again, what the agency priorities are but, you know, if the priorities are, you know, fire and water and you're in a watershed unit, then that, there's still a lot of leeway into how that can be interpreted. Um, one of the cool things about um, a lot of these, the research scientist positions within the federal government is a lot of them are, it's called, the, you're a, evaluated by a panel every several years. And you're actually encouraged, or I think you can, you, you'll, you, your promotion or potentially demotion will be dependent on your um, ability to, you know, uh, conduct and, and be, you know, sort of showing your autonomy in, in, in leading uh, new science questions. So um, your extent, you, the, your ability to do that is actually, is actually encouraged. Um, it may require getting external funding um, to, to do it. Uh, so you might be within the scope of what your, um, what your mission statement is, but um, you, you know, you can compete for grants similar to an academic uh, and similar, a lot of the same grants. Um, but again, I think, you know, securing that can, uh, again, can lead to career advancement to getting to, you know, changing your GS level um, within there. So it provides some nice opportunities and incentives for um, for that level of um, type of scientific inquiry. Great, thanks. We'll go to Holly and then try to squeeze in one more question before we break. Yeah, so I'm at the Smithsonian Institution and I guess I'd echo what a lot of people have already said that it, it's a little bit of both. Um, we have a really broad mission. It's kind of overall to disseminate knowledge. And within the Natural History Museum that I'm a part of, it's to understand the natural world better. So, um, and I actually, my position, not to go down a rabbit hole too much, but the Smithsonian is kind of weird federal agency. We're a mix of um, federal positions and trust positions. 
Um, <clears throat> so I actually am in a trust position. And so my, um, my job is soft money. And so I bring in grants to pay myself and my team. And uh, I have a ton of flexibility with what I study. Um, as long as it kind of meets the, uh, the, it's within the limits of the resources that we have and it gets approval from the higher ups as being kind of within the, the big Smithsonian mission. I usually get approval to do whatever I'd like. So it's nice. <laughs> Sounds like a nice place to be. Paige? Yeah, so I know we only have um, a couple more minutes. So I thought I would just kind of open it up um, to just uh, ask the panelists if there's any last minute thoughts, um, things that they think the students attending should know moving into their next career. And I know um, we've had a couple panelists that haven't been able to talk too much. Um, I'm thinking of like Kevin, Donato, Ali Ainsworth, um, some that maybe haven't had a chance to speak up, if you have any last minute thoughts um, that you think students should know moving into the next phase of their life. And we'll start with David. So um, one tip that I would give to people applying for federal jobs, because I'm a supervisor, I see a lot of resumes that come in through USA Jobs. You have an option in there to use a resume generator from USA Jobs or to upload your resume. Upload your resume. The resume generator creates a product that is difficult to read and review and is ugly and just it they just don't work it doesn't mean that you can't get a job if you're using that or that your skill set won't float up but it, just don't use those use your own over thank you gina I just want to say that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is currently hiring, so I would encourage you all to check USA Jobs. We also have direct hire authority in the Jacksonville District. I'm happy to share the QR code with all. Thank you, Lily. Um, I just want to say that um, people tend to look at the federal government like it's one humongous monolithic mass, and um, having worked at number of agencies i can say that each agency is different from each other so in every way almost that private sector or nonprofit organizations are different from one another the culture the age the diversity the whether it's progressive or conservative every conceivable way that agencies can differ they do so um if you end up in one place and if it's not for you don't necessarily discard the whole government thing try another agency if you want to stay in the government and and talk to as many people as you can who work at different agencies to get a feel of what they're about and there's a huge amount on different agencies um one of them is bestplacestowork.org there's a huge amount of information out there about agencies too so um it's not that hard to reach research but can have huge implications for your happiness of life thanks Thank you, Kevin. So my closing bits of, of advice for soon to be um, completed graduate students or early career folks is that um, your network matters. And so I, I did read through some of the questions that were posed during the, um, the video component of today's uh, discussion and panel. And, there were a lot of questions uh, that kind of related about, I don't know, so-and-so in, in this agency or so-and-so in that agency, how could I get a job? Well, if you are a graduate student, you do have a faculty advisor and, and a committee and utilize them as your starting point here to help jumpstart your connections, go to meetings, meet and talk with people. Um, the old adage of it's, it's who you know and not what you know, well, there's a certain truth to that, and it really does help open some doors for you. It might not be the same deal when you're talking about trying to apply for and receive a federal job, but it might matter in other uh, agencies, and it would certainly matter in the not-for-profits um, and within the uh, public sector and, and within tribal governments. So uh, rely on your networks, use them, they are a source for you, and make sure that when you are going to apply for your jobs, that you reach out 
to the very people that you are putting forward to be your professional references. Alert them <laughs> that you are applying for a job. Seek their permission to use them as a reference because uh, you want to make sure that the people that you are putting forward are going to give you the kind of reference that you actually want them to give. So people have to answer those questions honestly. And so it really behooves you to make sure that uh, you let those people know so that they can be your advocates and uh, not to bring you potential problems down the way. Thank you. Donato? Man, Kevin has hit the nail on the head. You gotta know who you're gonna know. You gotta have a big network. And that's how I got here. I mean, I, I kept saying yes to all the projects. I wanted to do every possible thing that was available to me in the, in the grad program. And so they promoted me to come down here. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. Kevin just excited me. I wanted to talk about the application process for the, the uh, federal government. The applications that you submit, they do not come directly to the people who are trying to do the hiring. There's a panel that goes through the process first. So when you do the application, you need to make sure you review the actual job announcement clearly. Try to find every possible keyword you can find in that job announcement, include it in your resume and support it in your resume. Show that you've done this work. You have to demonstrate that in the resume and speak in plain language as possible. Try not to get into too much jargon. If you know the jargon, reduce the jargon as much as possible. Say it in as clear and plain language as possible. Because again, the person it goes to first is not the professional in this field. Okay, so I have missed several qualified candidates for a position that I've been hiring for for several years because they didn't do this process that actually identifies every keyword. And then there's people who make it through the process who identify the keywords, have really low scores, but they still get floated to the top because they were able to check off everything that was on the list. And then so the people who are reviewing it, they are looking for honesty. And that's what they told me in the last round that, that I went through. They're looking to see if they can you know, vet out whoever possibly is not telling the truth or where you communicating what it is. So don't elevate yourself to the highest possible thing. And if you're not supporting that with the resume, over. Thank you. And Stephanie. Yeah, I'll just second all of that. I think I actually wrote that in a bunch of the answers I wrote. The uh, application process is not super straightforward, and uh, it is very true that things go through an entire long, complicated screening process before it even makes it to us. And so the key thing is, like, make sure you put so much detail. Like, my, my federal CV is, like, at least 15 pages long because I learned the hard way over the years that if you miss anything, you might get excluded. Like, I got denied from a biology position, even though I have a biology bachelor's degree, because they couldn't decide that I had enough biology batch, like coursework from my transcript. So write all your courses out, write as much detail as you can, and um, just make sure you are really supporting it, it, whatever you're answering to the questionnaires, like support it as much as you possibly can. And, and uh, yeah, other than that, just you have to have a lot of patience. And as, as Lily said, you know, every agency is very different. You may not find your best fit in, in one, you know, I, I went to a bunch of different agencies over the years and my best home is here at Bohm. And, you know, the, the culture just really works. The work that I do fits really well for me and, and the type of job that I have, you know, is a good fit for me. And so sometimes it requires a little trial and error. But the nice thing is once you're in the federal system, it does make it a lot easier for you to actually move around and and get to have other opportunities with other agencies as well. So um, sometimes it just requires a little trial and error. <laughs> and we'll end it off here with uh, Allie Ainsworth. She has her hand raised. I see. Okay, thanks. I never figured out how to get the hand raise on the computer, but um, this has been wonderful. Thanks for the opportunity. My recommendation is to keep applying, have patience. As everyone just said, it's incredibly frustrating on both sides. <laughs> we really want to hire you, but you know, we're hands are tied. The other sort of throwing the CESU link back out there, um, since I work for the CESU, 
we're really making a big effort nowadays to look across agency boundaries and work on partnership projects. And so I think some of the barriers between the agencies, at least in specific sites like Puget Sound's doing quite well with this now, are coming down. And so it's pretty exciting for scientists to really be working a lot more collaboratively collaboratively across agency boundaries. So while there are different missions and limitations, I mean, I think right now, at least the federal government is really trying um, in DOI and even between DOI and agriculture to find commonality. And we're even looking at joint funding opportunities and whatnot. So it's pretty exciting to be able to look at applying science on a landscape scale and really influencing management. So keep coming, we need you. Thanks. Thank you so much. And just a big thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you so much for giving your time previously for all the pre-recordings, as well as all of your fantastic advice and great insight. I think it's all of this has been so invaluable for all of us looking to move forward into um, a career with an agency. And so with that, I'll pass it back over to Marty and Gabe. Um, I just wanted to echo that and say thank you to everyone. I know there's a lot of time that went into this, and I hope it continues to be a valuable resource for everyone. Uh, the video will be posted on the website uh, within a week or so, and we'll also include the answers to the questions uh, that were in the chat, but that we didn't get to answer on screen. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Thank Bye you. all. Thank you.